Hey everyone and welcome! Hi Rina! Hug Sameach Hello, to you! Hi, Hug Sameach to you! And Hug Sameach to everybody who's out there uh, studying and learning with us tonight. It's Erev Shavuot, the evening of the giving of the Torah, as Mantaraktenu. It's the third of the pilgrimage holidays. And as Rabbi Matthew put it uh, not so long ago, it's sometimes forgotten because it comes in the spring where it's warming up out there and everybody's outside. But this is a really important holiday. And tonight we're going to talk about something really important, the power of words. When God created the world, he created it with words. Words have the power to create, but they also have the power to destroy. And that's the topic tonight, Gossip Lashon Hara. But I also have a question for you. Is it always a bad thing? So we're going to have a look at this tonight. And we're going to have a chat open so you can participate. There's going to be lots of questions and uh, an opportunity for you to also take part in this interactive session. My name that's is Rina Sector Elbaz. And uh, I'm in charge of education and engagement. And I'm very lucky to have Rabbi Mass with me here tonight to help run this session and to, uh, to add some important information as we move forward. Thank you, Rina. Thank you. It's great to have, to have so many people already connected at the beginning of this Tikkun Leil Shavuot. And remember, we are going all the way until 6 a.m. We're going to have two live sessions, but then we continue with the best of the best from 2020, 2021 between me and Rabbi Matthew, all the way until 6 a.m. So don't go anywhere. Go if you need, go prepare some popcorn or something. I don't know, ice cream, chocolate. Coffee. <laughs> coffee, but not until probably 2 or 3 a.m. That's when you need the coffee. And uh, But let me, let me uh, welcome quickly to everybody who is brave enough to say hello in the chat i can see claudette hale welcome robert didich thank welcome and thank you for all the wonderful graphics robert uh kathy perry hiller is here jury sharak phyllis Leifman, uh christy makovsky she's here also and corey glasper welcome everyone oh it's wonderful to have you and will this session be recorded for those who uh, aren't able to tune in right now of course we record everything after the stream is over it's going to stay on facebook and youtube i can see also christian ba uh Balin. Balin. that's th I, I hope i'm pronouncing it properly it's christian Balin. he's um also in one of our classes in several Excellent. Of our classes actually i heard the name of many of the students of the different courses <laughs> that uh, we offer it's it's wonderful that you're supporting us and you're here tonight I hope you can make it to 6 a.m. Yeah, or at and least they, at the end of the live session. Ashira is here, my wife. She says, Hug Sameach, yeah. everyone. Eva Block Super is here. She says, Hi. Louis Stern is here Hello with there. Deb. Also, uh, for our, uh, learning session. Clyde Hurtig, uh, Karen and Clyde are here. Hug Sameach. It's great to have so many. So, Rina, awesome. I, will turn it, I will turn it to you. And whenever you're ready for your powerpoint you let me know and i will make it live okay all right so let's ha go have fun okay and rabbi you'll uh, update us on the chat from time to time thank you okay so let me know rabbi when it's up and then I'm sorry if I look down from time to yes, time yes. because I have my booklet yeah, yeah. as well. Every, everything is ready. ready. Your PowerPoint is already on the screen, ready. ready to go. So we're going to look at the topic of gossip. In Hebrew, it's Lashon Hara, but you're going to see that there are a whole bunch of different words in Hebrew for that topic of gossip. We're going to look at what Judaism has to say about the topic and also what modern social sciences have to say. And you will find that there are a lot of things they have in common. So let's get right into the topic. Words are important. And as I said earlier, the world was created with words, but you can also destroy with words. Words are the path to peace. 
And this is something that we see three times a day when we see the silent amida, the silent devotion. It's a meditation and it reminds us of the importance of our words. Blessed are you, our Lord, who blesses his people Israel with peace. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable before you, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. My God, guard my tongue from evil and my lips from speaking deceitfully. We remind ourselves three times a day. And that's because it's so easy to slip into gossip. We don't even realize it's happening. So today we're going to look at a few different things that constitute gossip. And we'll look at a few things that can help us avoid it. Now, some of you may have seen my little challenge that I put up on Facebook a couple of days ago. It's the 24 hour challenge and we're gonna find out a little bit more about this. Now, if you haven't done it already, following this session, you may decide you wanna do this. So let's look at a definition from the Oxford Dictionary online, gossip. The noun is causal or unconstrained conversation or reports about other people typically involving details which are not confirmed as true. He became the subject of much local gossip. A conversation about other people, an instance of gossiping. She just comes around here for a gossip. Synonyms, a person who likes talking about other people's private lives. Which reminds me of this show that I watched with my daughter called Gossip Girl. And this gossip, meaning um, the person themselves as a gossip, is somebody who's anonymous, but she has a little newspaper and she is constantly evolving and influencing people's lives and not always in such a great way. Gossip as defined by modern social sciences. Why is complaining and gossiping about others harmful for you? So I this particular document, very interesting, from uh, Thrive Global, and it was a document that they put online as a professional development tool. There is nothing like an innocent gossip. So five things that complaining and gossiping does to you and your mind. So this is not the Jewish point of view, but you will find that many of the points that are mentioned here also come up in the Jewish um, definition of what gossip is. So the first is complaints of others affect you strongly, even if you aren't an active participant. Just look at what's happening right now on social media. It's very toxic and um, there's a, a very difficult situation, but all of the things that are happening on social media can also be very stressful. And I'm sure that many of you have been watching social media and maybe you'll take a break for Shavuot and rest your mind. It also lowers your standards and vision of your own life. And also not stopping complaints or boundaries will harm only you. If you allow people in, they affect how you feel about other people. And then one of the things that is so important is you shouldn't really care if other people are not happy about the fact that you shut down gossip. I remember once I was speaking to a woman about another person and it wasn't anything negative, but she very politely said, you know, I don't want to get into this conversation. And actually I didn't think poorly of her. It really made me think about it. So, I have a little booklet here that I put together because if anybody wants to have a copy, you can just reach out to the synagogue and we can send it to you. But I've developed each of these talking points. So why should you bother about what others think about you? It reflects only their not so happy state of mind and their own projections. Even if you're the center of the gossip, it isn't really about you. A happy person has no motive to go and talk negatively about others. On the contrary, an unhappy person always finds tons of reasons to complain and to gossip. Even if you change everything about yourself to their tastes, they change their mind and complain about how you've changed. Don't worry about them. Let them do what they do. 
and then focus on your own life. And then let's look at the fifth point here. Negative energy makes you do negative things. So think about it. Things you've seen on social media, it gets you all riled up and you get angry and then you say things that you regret. How many people have seen shouting matches taking place on social media? We may not be able to see people in person these days, but we definitely uh, see a lot of shouting matches going on online. Rabbi, what do you think about this? Have you experienced this? Well, well uh, I believe we all experience this in one way or another. It's uh, it, this this is uh, coming pretty much every day, uh, and yeah, it's um, yeah, it's unfortunate that that we have to deal with this so often. Teens especially fall victim to this. Like when I was growing up, we didn't have the social media. So the only gossiping that happened was was over the uh, telephone, right? And I remember I was in a, a school musical, The Music Man, and it starts out um, this scene at the very beginning and all these teens are on their telephones and they're all talking about this one and that one and, and Hugo and Kim and they got pinned and everyone's talking about them. And that was fairly innocent. But now the things that happen on social media and the gossip and the talking that goes back and forth, when yeah. the kids aren't even getting together, yeah, I, I believe that uh, something that I learned once that not every thought is meant to be said and not every not everything that you say is meant to be writ written down and not everything that is written down is meant to be published. That's <laughs> so, very true. Yeah. So ba basically, if you think about it, there are so, so many stages before somebody publishes something on social media. So it's uh, we, we have to relearn to take our time to think things. <laughs> yeah, think it through. Somebody once said, uh, twirl your tongue five times in your mouth before you actually say something. Yeah, I, it, it's uh, basically, it, it's in the Talmud actually. It's in the, uh, I believe it's Masechet Arachim, page 15b. I still remember that one. That basically, uh, it's, it's like God talking to the human body, wow. right? And God said to the tongue, all members of the human body are standing. You are lying down, <laughs> right? All members of the human body are outside. You're guarded inside. And they said, not only that, uh, you are surrounded with two walls, one of bone and one of flesh. And he's talking about the teeth and the lips. Wow. So basically he said that the tongue is the only organ is protected with two walls. So that, that why? Because it's almost like God knew the danger of giving too much uh, freedom to the tongue, because and we all know what happened when it just go rogue on yeah. that, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, now we're going to look at a little bit more about Jewish thought and the topic of gossip. Um, in Proverbs twenty-two one, it says that a good name is more desirable than riches a good reputation than silver and gold. If this were so, then to jeopardize a person's reputation through gossip and slander would be akin to destroying their lives. Judaism promotes the importance of a good name and warns us of the dangers of gossip and slander to a person's reputation and credibility. It's, it's almost like murder. And so we really have to think about this. And this brings us to the topic of the Chafetz Chaim, Rabbi Israel Meir Kagan. This influential 20th century Jewish figure established his reputation first and foremost as an opponent of Lashon Hara, evil speech. So he was known as the Chafetz Chaim, which would mean the one who runs after life, who chases life. That's uh, the translation of his name. And he was an influ influential rabbi of the Musar movement. And this is a movement that um, would get the individual to think about their behavior and to work on their personality and improving their personality. And in his teachings, he identified three levels of gossip. In English, we have one word for gossip. 
In Hebrew, there's three different levels, and each one is a little bit different. We have Rechilut, Lashon Hara, and Motzei Shem Ra. Let's find out a little bit about what each of these means. So Rechilut, repeating factual, neutral information about other people. Now, what could be bad about this? It's true. It's not bad. Why shouldn't we say it? So you know something, this is an example that I put up on the screen. You know something that Mr. A has done? Non-incriminating, non-incriminating, pardon me, not even objectionable. Unless you have a compelling reason, you are forbidden to share this information. Repeating innocuous gossip is called rechilut and often causes unforeseen negative consequences. Rabbi, earlier when we were talking about this, you mentioned an interesting example does that fall into the um, level one rechilut? I'm not sure if the rabbi heard me. I'll move on and we'll come back to Rabbi Mass with that question in a few minutes. Then we have level two, Lashon Hara. This is repeating factual information, but that is negative about another person. So speaking about another's indiscretion or shortcomings, and it is said that it is worse than repeating neutral information. This is called Lashon Hara, meaning the evil tongue. And in a few minutes, we're going to go into the details about why this is so bad. Now, you would think perhaps it would be important to know something negative if it could be harmful to you or you're protecting somebody from somebody else. And in certain cases, this is all right, but in general, even if it is negative, you shouldn't be doing it. Now, the third level, now this is really bad. Motse Shemra, repeating unfounded, libelous gossip. And the third most dangerous form of gossip is the spreading of what is known in today's jargon as fake news. And Rabbi Matthew spoke about this just recently. As a listen, we should be careful not to judge based on unverified allegations and take care not to to contribute to spreading fake news. That means that when you see somebody posting something on social media, before you post it to your page and share it, find out if it's really true. Find out if, um, you know, maybe call the person. I, I received this message from somebody that seemed very strange. I actually called them and I said, are you sure this is you? And it turned out that it wasn't. And if you see something in a newspaper that seems a little suspicious to you, check a different newspaper. You can go to more than one news source. Words carry the potential of causing catastrophic harm, often tearing asunder families and friendships. Thankfully, La Shonara awareness has increased in past decades, largely influenced by the passionate writings of the Chafetz Chaim on the topic. Hi, Rina. So I wanted to finish. I wanted to wait until you finish the three topics before ah, okay. saying it. So I, that's why I let I let you continue. Oh, okay. But uh, what what I think the problem with Rehi Lut is the intention, because that's the the, the idea. If it's because you can think what's wrong about doing Rehi Lut if you are actually sharing factual things, right? Right. It's the intention. It's why you say it, and most of the time, the reason why people go with it, go with this stories about other people is because you want uh, subject A to be mad to subject B. Ah, so that, you that's your gossip girl, Rabbi. Yeah, that's so you cool. feel that you you feel so important is so great because now these two people are fighting. Right? So th that's the whole idea. Just to share information in order for one person to have a negative opinion of somebody else. And in that way, people feel that they have a gain. And that's why Rehilut is also so bad. It's not about the facts. The facts are irrelevant. It's what you create with that. It's interesting that you talk about that, Rabbi. Um, so during the lockdown, I started watching these Hallmark movies. I found there was an interesting pattern. It wasn't too much of an emotional commitment. But what really caused the problems in each of these episodes or movies that I watched was the gossip and and bad intentions of trying to break up couples to create problems in families and there was really a pattern of poor behavior there mm -hmm. so um i really agree with you on that the intention is 
is very important. Yeah, and the musician rat, the last, the, the third category. Come on, we all know people that they even get paid to do that, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I always, I, I always think about those people that they, oh boy, they will have a problem in the whole Amaba when they have to respond for what they said because they, 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 they take it almost as a career. And uh, there are people that they are professionals. That's what it is. They are professionals of what they do. They are professional sp spreaders of Lashon Ra. And it looks like we we look at it as something that is, uh, well, it's, this is what's happening these days. It's a, it's a byproduct of the modern times. No, the Talmud said this is this been in humanity since the beginning of time. It's like those tabloid magazines, you know, they're on display as you check out at the supermarket. Um, but we play into it when we buy them. You know, are we just as guilty when we purchase the magazine? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure you're going to talk about that because you're talking about the Hafez time. And he said, yes. Basically, the, if, if you are listening to Lashana Ra, you are as guilty as the one who is spreading it. So... Yeah. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Keep going. Yes. So let's have a look here. Now I have 12 different components um, in the prohibition against listening to Lashon Hara as um, put down by the Chafetz Chaim. So the very first one is the prohibition against accepting or believing it. So first and foremost, it's forbidden, according to the Torah, to accept Lashon Hara. Whether um, Lashon Ara is regarding issues between man and God or issues between man and man, we should not believe that the story is true because doing so we lower our opinion of the subject. So I remember in high school, there was a certain girl who had a reputation and there were people who wouldn't talk to her. And it turns out it wasn't even true. But all of us thought that this girl had done this terrible thing. And uh, this was a perfect example of this particular situation. If the listener doesn't explicitly agree with the speaker's story, but if he does agree with the story, he doubles the violation. So first of all, you shouldn't listen. But if you listen and you agree, that's a double sin. Um, so it means that you're accepting the evil. One who accepts Lashon HaRav violates the prohibition Lo tisa shem shav, do not raise a false report. While the verse is generally understood against the speaker, the sages explain that it's also an exhortation to the one who might accept the Lashon Hara. So it's not just the one who says it, it's the one who accepts it. You are just as guilty if you buy that magazine as the person who wrote the magazine. Additionally, there are other positive and negative commandments by accepting Lashon Hara. Uh, as discussed previously in the introduction. The sages teach us anyone who accepts Lashon Ara should be thrown to the dogs. Okay, that's pretty harsh. But I suppose that what it can do to somebody's life and somebody's potential to make a living, um, maybe it warrants it. Uh, the sages also teach us that one who accepts Lashon Ara is worse than the speaker. Now, Rabbi, is there anything in the comments or the chat? I'm just curious. If people are reacting to this, no, no, no questions, no. no questions so far. But I, I keep posting messages reminding everybody that the chat is open, and if there is any interesting, ent any, any questions, I will bring it up to the stream. So, Excellent. yeah, but so you. far, no questions. You know, when nobody actually comments about what I'm teaching, I'm always doubtful and more was wondering if they either understand everything or nothing at all well i think <laughs> if i were if i were watching this i think it, it probably raises a lot of questions i and think that you make them oversensitive about typing something what if it's lashana ra what they say well you know it's also talking about dirty laundry yeah. so it's not like i think a lot of these points will remind people of specific cases that they experienced or that they witnessed. And um, that's good too. The last point that I have highlighted in yellow, I think it's important because it says that the one who accepts it's worse than the speaker, because if you don't accept it, 
you shut it down immediately. So it's done. But if you accept it, you allow it to go on and on. And I think that's why it's so terrible. So then there's the prohibition of listening. So there's, it's bad. And it's really bad to listen and accept. But it's also not good to listen. Even merely listening is a violation. Even if the listener intends not to believe anything while he was listening, simply bending his ear to hear constitutes a violation. So there's a course of distinction between hearing and accepting because in the case of listening, there's no prohibition unless the information has no future relevance to the listener. If, however, the information, should it be true, does have relevance to the listener, for example, if the listener realizes at the outset of, that the speaker um, that he wants to show through the story of the subject is untrustworthy or some other such trait and the listener is considering a business dealing or partnership with the subject, arranging a marriage with him or any similar involvement, it is permissible to listen in order to explore the information and protect himself. So there is a certain situation where if the information could prevent a bad thing from happening. So the listener's desire to hear the information must not be to listen to the disparagement of his friend, but rather to protect himself. So like you said earlier, Rabbi, it's really about the intention. Why are you listening? Is it just out of some curiosity for some juicy tidbit that you can pass on? Or is it because you want to protect yourself or a friend or family member from something unfortunate? It's a principle that if the listener will not benefit by hearing the information, but through his listening, good can come to others, it is permissible. So remember in the title of the session, I said, is, I said, is it always bad? It's not always bad, but you have to be listening for the right reasons. When is, it permiss when is it permitted to listen? So sometimes it actually is permitted to listen. Let this not be a surprise to the reader that he should say, how can we possibly satisfy the expect expectations of heaven? For you have defined the parameters of the law such that even listening to the disparagement of one, one's fellow is forbidden. Yet, what if the information is relevant to me with regard to my business or for other reasons? So it's not to find out about a third party, but it's really something that could be beneficial to you. So here's the answer. If someone were to approach him and should want to talk about another, and he understands that the speaker wants to speak negatively about the other person, he should ask the speaker, will the information that you want to tell me um, have future relevance to me? Or will I thereby um, be able to rectify a situation by rebuking the offending individual or some other positive outcome. So for example, let's say you want to tell me some gossip about this person and something terrible they did. If I think that I can correct uh, wrong information and set you straight, in that case, you are allowed to listen to the gossip. And this could also be with setting people straight um, when they don't have the facts and all in a, in a variety of different situations or the facts are wrong and they think poorly about somebody because of it. So Rina, I have a question here from the chat. Yes. And this is from Clyde. And the question, Clyde. And, no, actually it's from, Ke from Karen. Karen said, okay. huh. if you have had a bad experience with surgery, from a doctor, for example, and a friend is planning on having surgery with that doctor, shouldn't you tell them? Rabbi, that is an excellent question. I'm not sure. I think that it, now this would not be my subjective opinion, but if we were to apply the rules that we just looked at, then perhaps it would be all right to talk about it maybe in the sense where the patient could approach the doctor and ask them yeah and, and i think also uh yeah there is when you know about a danger in judaism you have the obligation to speak up 
Mm-hmm. So basically, you, you can't actually argue. You, let's say that you know that somebody's about to kill somebody else, and you don't say anything, and then the the, the crime happens. Right. And then somebody says, and then you say, "Oh, I knew about it." So how come you didn't say anything? Sorry, I didn't want to spread lashonara. That there are certain circumstances <laughs> when you yeah. have to speak up, especially especially in case of doctors when you consider that you are saving somebody else's life. Because we know that in Judaism, saving a life basically overrides every other commandment, including Lashonara. But we have to be very careful. Okay? Right. Oh, right. Here we have a great question from Louis Stern. Okay. <laughs> What about going to a restaurant and it sucked? Do I tell my friends? Okay, so here's an interesting point. Because... I, I'm not going to say names because that would be La Shonara, but there was a lovely restaurant that had opened and a um, restaurant critic went in and just slammed the restaurant. And for months, for months, they had very few customers and their food was delicious. So, yeah, I was, yeah. I wouldn't say anything because it's not a question of life and death and okay. it's subject. It's, it's, it's something that is very relative. That's Because right. maybe maybe your complaint is I don't know that the food was too spicy, right? And some people like spicy food, so it works for some and not for others, right? Yeah, and I know that sometimes it's bad service and thing, but if it's me, I never do it. I never post any negative comments. I never go online to 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 rate things. It's right. just me. It's just me. So I, I would never do it. I once saw this television program where they talked about the wisdom of the crowd. So it means that if you get a pool of, let's say, 100 different comments, by the time you go through all of the comments, you have like, Rabbi, what you have presented in Machloket Matters, where you, you have a, a discrepancy. So you had 45 or 49 people who said they liked it and another 49 people who said they didn't like it. So it was kind of like a dispute, a Machloket Um where you get the for and against. Yeah, but, but if, if there is somebody who specifically asked me, did you go to that restaurant? Yes, I did. Did you like it? I would say, no, I didn't. And I would tell them why. But I wouldn't start that conversation myself. Yeah, I think that that's fair. So um, I see the time is moving along here. So I'm going to move on with my next slide. Number four, um, from the Chafetz Chaim, could suggest that it could even be a mitzvah, a, um, a positive commandment to uh, listen to Lashon Hara, to listen to the disparaging words one says against another. For example, if the listener determines that through listening to the entire story, he will then be able to show the speaker or other listeners that the information is inaccurate um, or some other explanation to exonerate the subject of Lashon Hara. The listener recognizes that by listening to the speaker, he might be able to quiet his own anger, that he will not uh, continue to speak to others. So these are two different examples where you should listen because either you could change people's minds because you have the correct facts or because maybe it'll calm you down. So this is something that I, I feel is important for people to know. So gossip is not always bad, but it depends Why? Now, what about one who unknowingly joins a Lashon Hara gathering? You go to a lovely cocktail party and unwittingly you're sitting with a group of people, and I'm looking at the text in yellow here, gathered for a non-gossip purpose, because I couldn't imagine people gathering for a gossip purpose. That would really be ugly. And the people begin speaking forbidden words of Lashon Hara. Is it possible to leave the group? Um, now, if you can't leave the group because it's like an intimate dinner party, um, then what do you do? So if you cannot leave the group, then um, you have to say something to show that you are not comfortable listening or you should be able to shut it down. But to just sit there and listen and not, at least by your facial expressions, show that you are displeased is considered as if you were participating. 
Regarding the case in which the person will not leave or plug their ears, there are three items which if the listener is very careful to follow will save them from the violation. So decide in your heart with absolute certainty, certainty that you will not believe the derogatory talk. That's really hard because once it, you've heard it, it still could influence, could influence you. I'm thinking of a court of law where um, sometimes the judge will say that a particular fact or um, a piece of information should not be taken into account by the jury. But I always wonder, like, they're not supposed to take it into account, but they've heard it. It's out there. So will it have some kind of an effect on them? Um, and then the person listening in this case that they can't help but be there should not enjoy hearing the forbidden stories. This is going to take a, a great amount of willpower. And then the third point, he should also take care not to show the speakers any movement that would indicate agreement with their words. Um, he, should remain as, he should remain as mute as stone, or he can display an angry face such that they will realize that he does not agree with the empty words even better. So Rabbi, has anybody commented on this? Nope, so far, last last comment was from the Stearns, so okay. about the restaurant. All right, we're going to move on then. Now, this is, this is getting a little bit spicier here. One who knowingly joins a Lashon Harad gathering. So because I'm going to try to move it along here, I'm going to um, just look at the segments that are highlighted. If, however, at the time that he wants to join them. They were already speaking forbidden words. So let's say you're at, um, you're at a bar mitzvah party and you go up to this group and you know that they're talking about a certain problem with so-and-so and you do go and join them. And then when you hear them, you're too lazy to, to leave the conversation. Or he recognizes them to be a group that is the type that always speak badly of others. Um, even if he does nothing to add or support the conversation and he is not interested in it, he is nonetheless a sinner just as others in the group. So, like, is that a bad thing to watch The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, which is full of gossip and all of these juicy tidbits? Is that a bad thing if we don't even know these people? Just putting it out there to the audience. Then, point seven judging favorably. And Rabbi, stop me uh, at any time if there's somebody who has something they want to add about these questions. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the chat. Great. Judging favorably. Know well that just as we have studied that the poskin authorities of Jewish law, the poskim, that's the plural of posik, regard it as a Torah violation to believe derogatory words about another, it's also a viola violation if the listener knows that the information he was told is true and the information could be interpreted in different ways. If the speaker is judging the subject as guilty and he thereby dishonors the subject. So we should be trying to um, assume the best of people, that people have good intentions, Um, even if we know that um, the information that we're hearing is true, assume that a person did it for good reasons. Nobody can judge unless they've been in that person's shoes. Judging the righteous favorably. Why the righteous? Would this mean somebody in authority? Would this mean a rabbi? Would this mean somebody who is supposed to be looked upon for their excellent behavior. So this applies if the story was about an ordinary person who typically takes care not to sin, but succumbs occasionally. How much more so if the story were about a God-fearing person? So this is very, very important that somebody Um, who is respected in the community, if you hear gossip about them, always assume that they have good intentions and they've acted for the right reasons. Prohibition against accepting parallel parallels that of speaking. So just as the prohibition of accepting Lashonara applies when the speaker talks, 
about one who acted improperly, in that we are commanded not to decide in our hearts that it is true as discussed in the first paragraph. The prohibition of accepting Lashon Hara applies to all instances in which speaking Lashon Hara is prohibited, such as embarrassing him uh, because of his older relative's behavior uh, or his own past actions when he now conducts himself appropriately. So reminding people of their past. Um, I always think of, uh, you know, at people's weddings when they do a roast and they they um, embarrass people with past behavior. Maybe that's not such a good idea. Uh, they say that the guiding principle is as follows. Anything for which the speaker is prohibited to say, there is a prohibition upon the one who believes or accepting it uh, or believes it for accepting it. So this is something that um, one has to be careful of as well. Then here's something we hadn't thought of, uh, using Lashon Hara to protect yourself. This is maybe to draw attention away from yourself. Even though we learn that accepting Lashon Hara um, for one to decide in his heart that the information is true is forbidden, um, suspecting uh, is appropriate. So there's a story here um, of Gedalia ben Achikam and his assassination. In the last chapter of Kings, is the basis for the Gemara discussion about suspecting Lashon Hara to be true. The Gemara relates that Gedalia was warned about Ishmael, the leader of the assassination, yet he rejected the informer's story because it was Lashon Hara. So Rabbi spoke about this earlier when he, um, when he was asked about the importance of talking about um, a specific doctor who's um, a, a patient who had a, a, a bad experience with a particular doctor in surgery. So just because you are worried that it might be Lashon Hara, you may be saving somebody from uh, from harm. We have a question. Okay. Another question from Clyde. Wrote, okay. Roasting someone at a wedding is in jest. Isn't okay. that okay? Ah, what do you think, Rabbi? It, 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 it's an interesting question. Yeah. It's, uh, because sometimes it's also relative. It's also relative, and it's uh, it, 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 and it also depends w because one thing is to make fun of somebody else who could fall into the category of the prohibition of embarrassment, right? right? And a different thing is start sharing information about a person. There are two different things, right? Because sometimes roasting is not so much about uh, sharing information, but about making fun of things that they are well known. But I guess it might be a problem when you start telling stories. Oh, remember when we were at school and you did this and that, and nobody know nobody knows about it. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's a very very thin line. I was thinking that it's a fine line, and so I guess everybody judges differently. So you could be treading on dangerous territory with that. Yeah, so I saw once. I saw once a video on the internet uh, that it was. For a wedding and then they put it together and it was shown during the ceremony as people were entering to the wedding there was this guy who was an entertainer who right. was asking questions to the guests about the yeah. bride and groom and then but then the guy put it all together in a video and it was shown and was it shocking <laughs> uh, some of the things i think it was a very bad taste to my to, to me hmm. and yeah it was probably consider uh Lashon Hara in many aspects that's that's really that's disappointing but and I've seen other other roasts other roasting that's you know the, the the recipients was fully aware and give consent and I believe that's different if you give consent I think that would make sense and the person would know what was coming yeah I think that would that would be a good a good way to be able to still do that fun part of the festivities yet to not damage somebody's reputation i have two more points here um the suspicions cannot affect the subject the suspect pardon me so many people make mistakes when suspecting the veracity of lashon hara 
Um, and this subject needs much discussion. While there isn't enough room to elaborate on, upon the different kinds of mistakes here, um, we'll discuss um, in the last section. However, the guidelines are as follows. When Lashon Hara is to be regarded as a concern, this is only in order to protect oneself from the subject. However, heaven forbid one should not act against the subject or cause him harm or embarrass him in account of the information, either in a large or small manner. And this is actually going back to that topic of the roasting of somebody at a, a wedding. So I think it was interesting, but I'm sure there's lots of other examples here. Okay, Kathy Hiller here, she, she yeah. posted a question. She said, if it's, uh, is it not a matter of mana or of intent? Yeah. So if it's not harmful by enjoying, will this not be okay? Well, it depends who's enjoying, because the person <laughs> being talked about might not enjoy it so much. But like, I guess if they know it's coming and there's yeah. no surprises. But sometimes it is Kavanaugh, because when you start roasting somebody, you want everybody to have to have or to develop certain opinion about the subject. Yeah. That's the the bad part, because that's your goal. Right. And won't you change how you think about that person? Yeah. You might never see them the same way. Because if it's just to, to laugh, I guess the intention will be correct. But if your intention is to uh, diminish the opinion of somebody in front of everybody else, so then, yeah, there is a problem. There's a, a, it's definitely a Lashon Hara. Um, and then the last one is about repentance. Um, and I think the important thing is when, when we talk about, for example, Yom Kippur and repenting, of course we have to ask God for forgiveness, but when you damage somebody's reputation or you embarrass them, the very first person you have to ask forgiveness from is from that person. And uh, that's sometimes not so easy, but it's definitely something to take into consideration. So those were the 12 um, points from the Chafetz Chaim. And I read a wonderful book uh, uh, several years ago, Joseph Telushkin, who is a leading Jewish thinker and writer, um, he came to Winnipeg and he presented this beautiful book called Words That Hurt and Words That Heal. And one of the things that I was very impacted by was this 24-hour challenge that he put forward to everybody who attended this event. And he asked us, can we for 24 hours refrain from gossiping, from listening to gossip, and even shutting down situations that would suck us into gossip? And I tried it. And I realized that every hour there was a situation that presented itself. And when I told people I'm taking the 24-hour challenge, it made it actually easier for me to shut it down because I wasn't like offending them. I didn't want to make people feel that I was judging them when I shut it down. So telling them I was doing this challenge was actually a really nice way for me to change the subject. So I, I felt that was, uh, was a beautiful challenge and I would challenge all of you to try it, maybe over the holiday of Shavuot. The last section, um, I'm just going to briefly give you a couple of pointers of things that you can do to um, circumvent uh, gossip. But I found this point interesting. According to Yale University researcher, we spend at least 60% of our adult conversations talking about people who are not with us at the time. So that's really something to think about. When you do this 24-hour challenge, you may not be talking very much. So just very briefly, um, seven ways you can respond. Talk about your openness to people from diverse backgrounds. So if you want people um, not to be talking um, about things in a xenophobic way, the way they talk about newcomers or specific groups of people, Speak in an open, positive way, and you may have a, a good impact on people, and it may be a way of preventing it before it happens. Boost the self-esteem of the gossip, meaning the person who gossips, with something you like about them, because often people will gossip because they don't have a great um, sense of self-worth. 
talk about cultural difference. When a person gossips uh, about someone from another culture, it's possibly because they don't know about the, the customs of that culture. See how it makes you feel um, without judging, as I said earlier. Avoid having a conversation that includes gossip. Um, you know, I'd like to chat about this, but we're just change the topic. Confront the gossip if it's, if it's ugly and turn the gossip into hope and help. And like the Chafetz Chaim always said, we must always hold the reins of the animal within us. So I, um, I stopped sharing my screen. I'm not sure, Rabbi, if um, you're able we, to we, remove it for we, me. We, yeah, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything is good. And we have one more comment here from Joanne Seif. Great. And she says, if you are celebrating with bride and groom, it seems like anything that might possibly embarrass or hurt them seems har harmful to me. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think that makes total sense, Jackie. And I guess, you know, it's it's sometimes uh, we laugh at other people's, um, you know, it, it might be a joke for us, but it can be hurtful. And I think also when people are in a vulnerable place in their lives, we have to be extremely careful about that. So, yeah. you know, maybe some of our customs, uh, we might want to rethink them. Yeah. And there is one thing that I remember that I, I learned, that because there are many rabbis that they, uh, they recommend that even paying a compliment to somebody else is forbidden. Because really? when you, yes, because if you say, for example, oh, that person is such a great dancer, you open the door to the other person to say, yes, but. You know, Rabbi, I once heard that. Um, I was at an event and somebody commented that um, this person was a wonderful public speaker and somebody who was sitting beside us said, I don't think they're so fine. Yeah, that's why I say compliments <laughs> usually open the door to Lashon Ra. So we have to be very careful with that too. Because it's usually the other person say, yeah, I'm not sure because this and that. And yeah, I just came back that that teaching that I I learned many years ago at the seminary. They were saying about in, the, in the class about Lashon Ra. So um, I really want to thank all of you for coming and for Rabbi for... Um, being with me this evening and uh, and helping to um, to host this event. This is just the beginning, though. I think all of us should take the time and think about it. We can ex certainly explore this topic further. There is a whole other section from the Chafetz Chaim that I would like to to look at with the audience, and maybe when we get to meet in person, we can do that. But uh, in the meantime. I invite you to a whole evening of learning. We're going to be studying with Rabbi Mass. We're going to bring in the holiday together. I have my uh, candles here. Oh, wonderful. And, uh, as soon as you're ready, can you see them, Rabbi? Yes, I'm going to make you full screen so everybody can see it on the on full screen. Okay, Great. whenever you're ready. Okay. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, Asher kitshanu b'mitzvotah, Vetsivanu lehadlik ne'shel yom tov. Amen. Amen. Chag Sameach. Can we do a Sheikh Yanu? Yes. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Shechianu vekimanu vehigianu lazman hazeh Amen Amen Thanks Amen. everyone Looking forward to your session, Rabbi. 
Well, Yasha Koyak, Rina, wonderful Thank class. You. Wonderful Thank class. You. So um, remember, remember that uh, the class stays on YouTube and Facebook. So after the class is over, after we finish this the stream, you can always go back to our channels and basically find all the classes that we taught for the last few years. We've been keeping everything. And some of that is going to be uh, played tonight from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. So don't miss that one. But we are going to take a short uh, break now, about five minutes. And after that, I'm going to be teaching about Jewish ethics. I just had a little introduction because Jewish ethics is a big topic. If you think that That's gossip sure. is a big topic, <laughs> Jewish ethics is... Uh, and and then when I was I started to prepare the class, I said, oh boy, what have I done? It's a, <laughs> why do I... Why do I have to? It's a, so, but we are, going, we are going to have a little introduction so you can understand what we understand about Jewish ethics. So that's going to be after the break. Thank you, Rina, Yashir Koyach, Chag Sameach. Chag everybody. Chag Sameach, Rabbi, to you and your beautiful family. Thank you, you too. So we are going to continue with, uh, I'm going to run a little timer and uh, we are going to see each other, God willing, in about five minutes. Let's take a break. Uh, let's take a break together.
and hello everyone I'm back back to action back to study back to the Tikkun Leil Shavuot and I'm so happy that I see so many of you still here it's already 9 p.m. wow wow good for you that you take a time to study Torah you take a time to celebrate Shavuot in a traditional way which is which is not, not only with cheesecake, kugels and pizzas and ice creams, but also with the study of Torah. Remember, Shavuot is the celebration of the revelation of Torah on Sinai, which is very interesting. Very interesting, because we call it Zman Matan Torah, the time of the giving of the Torah, not the time of the receiving of the Torah. And why is that? Because all what God is doing tonight is to give us the Torah. To receive it or not, totally up to you. Hopefully, a night of study is going to uh, motivate you in order to receive the Torah and make the Torah part of your life. Now, uh, we have a very interesting word in Judaism that is halacha, Jewish law. And that is basically the will of God in a written form, which is the Torah. That's the way we have to know what God wants from us. So, as Jews, we learn behavior, we learn to do what is right, basically by following the teachings of the Torah. So that's why we can talk about something like Jewish ethics. There is such a thing, a thing of Jewish ethics because this is the kind of behavior that is influenced by Torah. And that's what I wanted to bring to you tonight and that's hopefully what we're going to study. But then again, before we go into that, another big Yashir Koyak to Dr. Rina Sektor Baz for her wonderful class on gossip. Uh, and she's teaching all the time. If you want to know more about uh, all her upcoming classes and my upcoming classes and Rabbi Matthew's programs, all you have to do is to f go to our website and then go to upcoming events and you're going to find all the information. And of course, you can also go to Facebook and you will have also all the information on our Facebook page. Just a reminder, the chat is open. If you have any comment, you can go to the chat and we can be in touch that way. So I'm going to bring here my first slide so we can start studying. By the way, uh, we are going to study for about uh, 45 minutes. I'm pretty sure I, I need to finish the, the stream at the latest 10 to 10 because I have to prepare the next one, which is the the, the one that starts 10 o'clock. So at 10 to 10, I'm going to finish the stream and then at 10 p.m. is going to start a fresh one. So you may have to uh, refresh the browser or whatever you're using just to be sure that you can watch that one as well. And also a reminder that the, the stream that starts at 10 p.m. is pre-recorded, so it will be nobody checking the chat. You can chat among yourselves, but we won't be reading it during the class. Now, look at this, what I put here in on the screen. And this is very interesting because I'm talking about Allah, I'm talking about the will of God, I'm talking about the law of God. When, but there is this interesting verse in the book of Exodus, chapter 22, verse 30. That it says, Ve'anshei Kodesh Tihiu Li. Ve'anshei Kodesh Tihiu Li. And it's translated as, And you shall be people imbued with holiness unto me. But at the time to comment this verse, Rabbi Menachem Mendel of Kotsk, of course, he was a Hasidic Rebbe, he said something very interesting. First be a mensch. A person of integrity and honor and then and only then only after your mensch be holy how did he learn that from this verse well very easy he followed the order of the words because in hebrew says it says 
ואנשי קודש. אנשי comes from the word איש. איש means person. אוקיי? Okay? So the order says and a person and then it says holy. So because of the way it's written, Rabbi Menachem Mendel of Kotsk learned first you have to become a person. Person in the sense that you don't behave like an animal anymore. You are a human being with all that that implies. First you have to figure that out. And then and only then you can start working out a way of attain holiness but not before not before you become a good person and let me tell you why and this is so much connected to Shavuot on Shavuot we count the Omer right for 49 days in fact I counted every night it was amazing every year at the end where I have a little chart and I mark every time that I count the Omer and every night of the Omer we're supposed to reflect on a trait of character Why is that? To prepare ourselves to receive the Torah. But they say, why do you have to prepare yourself to receive the Torah? Aren't we supposed to receive the Torah so the Torah will prepare us? What do we have to do before that? Well, we and Shei Kodesh, the only. First, you have to do the work to become a good person even before you open the Torah. Because becoming a good person... It's not necessarily depending on Torah. Once you reach that point, yes, the Torah is going to take you to the next level. But if you don't do that work before you even open the Torah, you know what happened? You're going to use the Torah to justify your evil. And that unfortunately happens. I will say in every religion, every religion that we all know of people, that they will use their holy books as an excuse to perform evil. Why? Because they open those holy books without a pure heart. So I like what the Torah is implying here, that there is some kind of process that we have to do even before we embark ourselves in the study of Torah. Okay? And we are going to see that as well. Because then we have an attention in between something that we figured out ourselves and something that it will be said in the Torah. Two things that sometimes are going to be uh, at conflict with each other if they contradict each other. So then we have to decide what to do. So... Uh, Let's go uh, quickly about, I, wa I wanted to show you about halakha, how we understand the law of God in Judaism. Just a quick reminder, we have 600 and 613 mitzvot commandments that it can be subdivided into 248 positive mitzvot and 365 negative mitzvot. Positive mitzvot are commandments to do something, such as the commandments to honor your mother and father. Uh, in Hebrew, these are called mitzvot ase, commandments to do. Now, negative mitzvot are commandments not to do something, such as the commandments not to murder. In Hebrew, these are called mitzvot lo ta'ase. Okay? So this is basically the source of halakha, of commandments that we have from the Torah. And then those 613 were expanded, explained, supplemented, etc. by the rabbis in what we call the Talmud. So between the written Torah and the Talmud expanding the 613 commandments is what we call halakha and is supposed to guide our lives telling us what to do and what not to do. In theory, if you follow that, specifically the commandments that they are uh, between us and other people, that will that's supposed to make you an ethical individual but we all know that unfortunately not always happens because sometimes we feel that even though the Torah is saying something for some reason our heart is strongly telling us something else one of the famous examples that I can think of is the story that we read in 
Genesis, when God goes to tell Abraham that God is about to destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Listen what happened here. I want to read just a few verses of it. Okay. Adonai said, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so serious that I will now go down and see whether they did warrant the outcry that had reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before Adonai. So this is, remember, the, the angels came to visit Abraham, and this is the way how God uh, let Abraham know what God was about to do. So, uh, Abraham approached approach God and said, Will you actually sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Maybe there are 50 righteous people in the city. Will you actually sweep the place away and not forgive it for the sake of the 50 righteous who are there? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous along with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Fight be it from you, shouldn't the judge of all the earth do what is just? just? Adonai said, if I find in Sodom 50 who are righteous, then I will forgive the whole place. For their sake. Let's try to understand what's going on here. God is saying to Abraham, I'm going to do this. In other words, this is my will. And Abraham had the chutzpah <laughs> to say to God, dude, you're wrong. <laughs> you're not supposed to do that. And not only that, God said to Abraham, you are absolutely right. Do you understand this back and forth that is going on here? This is huge because now it's almost empowering Abraham to also develop a concept of what is right and what is wrong that it seems to be, uh, I wouldn't say independent, but at the same time of what God is telling us. And then it's going to be, our, our life is going to be in between these two things, if what we learn coming from God and what we learn coming from our own understanding of the world, they are two parallel processes. And that's why uh, we have to prepare, for example, ourselves before even receiving the Torah. Because we need to first develop that sense of understanding of right and wrong, which then is going to be... Uh, checked against or balanced with the understanding of the will of God. Hi, Rina. I see you are, you're back. You're back. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to the class. So this is very interesting because I want to present to you now three different ways that we have to balance our understanding versus the understanding of God. Okay, the first example that I can think about is going to be Noah and his understanding of God and God's will. Then it's going to be Abraham and his understanding of the will of God. And finally, I wanted to present to you uh, the understanding of Moses that is going to be a little bit different. So let's get to it. First, let me present to you two different approaches, one for Noah, one for Abraham. Okay, In Genesis 6-9, it says, this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a man righteous and wholehearted in his generation. Noah walked with God. Very nice. But then in Genesis 17-1, when it's talking about Abraham, by the way, back then it's, his name was Abram, without the H. The H was added later on. So when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty, walk before me faithfully and be blameless. I don't know if you caught what's going on here. Let me bring this. Look at the difference. Look at the difference. First, it says that Noah walked with God. But then to Abraham, 
God said, walk before me. So now the rabbis notice that there are two different concepts here. One thing is walking with God, and the other thing is walking before God. What does it mean that Noah walked with God? It means that God was actually holding Noah's hand every step of the way, meaning that Noah wouldn't do anything unless God will tell Noah what to do. And if God will say something to Noah, Noah wouldn't dare to question that, and he will do it without arguing. How do we know that? Because when God said to Noah, I'm going to destroy the world and I'm going to save you and your family, so go build the ark, Noah said, yes, sir. Sir, yes, sir. That's the way he said. And he ran to build the ark. And when the flood finally came, Noah, his family, and the animals sent him to the ark, and nobody else. Why? Because according to the Midrash, he didn't even try to convince other people of his generation to change their mind. Why? Because God didn't tell him that he had to do that. God said, do the ark, build the ark. Noah said, yes, sir. He went and built the ark. Why? Because he walked with God. I guess in his generation, he was a righteous person. It says there, Noah was a man righteous and wholehearted in his generation. So compared to other people, he was a good person. He followed God. He followed God's commandments without any argument, any arguments. But then we have Abraham. And he was different. But this is the interesting thing. It looks like Abraham wasn't different because he was naturally different. God didn't want Abraham to behave like Noah. So now God taught Abraham a new way to walk in this earth. God said to Abraham, walk before Abraham me faithfully and be blameless so that is also important but what does it mean walk before god it means abraham i'm empowering you to take the initiative you don't have to wait until i telling you to do something because you have what it takes you're already equipped with this sense of figuring out when things are right and things are wrong. So don't be afraid to take the initiative. Go ahead. I'm allowing you. I'm giving you permission to walk before me, to take the initiative. But always be sure at the same time to be faithful and blameless. So don't misuse the power that I'm giving you. And that's why I believe Abraham felt empowered by God to the point that Abraham said to God, I think you're wrong. You would think, how can, <laughs> you know, if God comes to visit you and God said, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, are you going to argue with God? Or you're going to be so excited that God actually stopped by and to talk to you, and you will be in awe and you won't argue with God. Yeah, Peter, hi, welcome. So, Peter, you said, Enoch, Enoch also walk with God. It was very common. That, those were the, the, that, that, can, that was the way of the world before Abraham. Before Abraham. But now God empowered Abraham to walk before God and to take the initiative on ethical issues. And that's why God, uh, Abraham tried to defend the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay? But we have to understand that all this episode happened before, before the revelation of Torah. And that is not a little thing. Because once we, the Torah was revealed, we have a, another piece of information that neither Noah nor Abraham had. And that is God's uh, word, the word of God which we know that is an amazing and is a, a valuable source of information. So if we can study all that information, it will give us the tools 
It will give us the tools to make even better ethical decisions. So that's why it's so important to study the Word of God, to study Torah, to understand how God is, to understand how God operates, so we can be, uh, or, or, or as the rabbi said, we can imitate God. We can be inspired by God. But first, what we have to do is to contemplate God's ways and then to incorporate that into our lives to supplement our natural understanding of right and wrong. And this is very interesting because, as I mentioned before, uh, I believe this is what happened to Moses. And let me show you what I'm talking about. Now we go into the book of Exodus. And we have this episode when Moses said to God, I said, God, uh, let me behold your presence. And God answered, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim before you the name Lord and the grace that I grant and the compassion that I show. But he said, you cannot see my face, for man may not see me and live. And the Lord said, see, there is a place near me. Station yourself on the rock. As my presence passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and shield you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. I don't know if you can imagine this, but basically now we have the opposite. Before we have Abraham in front of God, now we have God in front of Moses. In other words, what God is telling Moses, I will go first, and then after I went by, you can analyze what you saw, and you're going to learn something. But it's, it's, it's basically, this is our lives after the revelation. God revealed the Torah. In, in other words, God, God passed by. And now, by looking at what happened, we can get inspired and we can learn from that revelation so we can inspire our lives to make better decisions. Hello, Dr. Debbie Pollack. Welcome, Chag Sameach, to you. Chag Sameach. So, uh, yeah, you missed, you missed a good chunk of the class, Debbie, but I, I, as I always say, after the stream is over, you can always go back to our, to our YouTube channel or to our uh, Facebook channel and you can get everything there. And by the way, by the way, I don't want to forget, uh, you can always subscribe as well to our channel. And if you subscribe, remember to hit the bell. Very important. So you can uh, receive notifications every time we go live, every time we upload something to our channels. So let's continue starting here. As I said, the other way to learn is to learn from God. And this is something very important in Judaism, to understand God. And once you understand different things from God, then you can make even better ethical decisions in your life. Now, I wanted to bring to you a text from the Talmud talking specifically about this. This is from the Masechet Sota in the Babylonian Talmud. And it says, And Rabbi Hama, the son of Rabbi Hanina, said, What does the written verse mean? You shall follow after the Lord your God. You see again, after the Lord your God. It's, it's amazing. Now, now you, you can see that everything makes sense. How it's uh, you, you let go, God go first. And then you learn from that experience. So what does the written verse mean? You should follow after the Lord your God. Well, can a person actually follow after the divine presence? Has it not already been stated? For the Lord your God is a consuming fire. Rather, the verse means to follow after the attributes of the Holy One, blessed be He. 
just as God dresses the naked, as is written in Genesis, the Lord God made leather garments for Adam and his wife and dressed them. So you should dress the naked. The Holy One, blessed be he, visited the sick. As it is written, the Lord appeared to Abraham at the oaks of Mambre. So you should visit the sick. Uh, remember, this is uh, the, the verse is talking about God visiting, visiting Abraham right after his circumcision. I wanted to put that in context. Next, the Holy One, blessed be he, com comforted the mourners, as it is written. Then, after the death of Abraham, God blessed Isaac, Isaac, his son. So you should comfort the mourners. The Holy One, blessed be he, buried the dead. And it is written in Deuteronomy, he, God, buried Moses in the valley. So you should bury the dead. So this is what the Talmud is trying to bring. It's just a few examples of how important it is to understand God's attributes so we can incorporate those in our lives. So then eventually when we have to make a decision, we want to have a God-like decision in our lives. And, uh, and th that is a wonderful thing that we can do for our Jewish life to get to know God, to be sure that we can make better decision. Now, this is all good. This is all good. But how do we reach this point? How can we actually learn from God's attributes? Yes, it's in the Torah. Yes, it's in the Talmud. Yes, it's in many other books. But how can we practically make that happened well very interesting because the rambam the maimonides already wrote about that and he brings something very interesting very interesting pay attention to this because i love it it says it is a positive commandment of the torah to cling to this to sages in order to learn from their deeds as expressed in the verse and to god you shall cling but is it possible for a person to cling to the divine presence? Yeah, we read that. We read that in the previous verse, right? In the previous text. But listen to Maimonides' answer. Rather, the sages said the following in explaining this commandment: Cling to sages. Therefore, a person should strive to marry the daughter of a sage and to marry off his daughter to a sage, and to eat and drink with sages and to do business with a sage and associate with them in every type of association, as it is stated, and to cling to God. And similarly, the sages commanded as follows: sit amid the dust of their feet and drink in the words with thirst. This is from Pirkei Avot. Now, it's interesting because even though I'm saying the word sages, uh, Maimonides is specifically talking about rabbis. Okay, So basically what it says is, and to God you shall cling, you should understand it, and you should get close to your rabbis. Why? Because that's the easiest way to learn the attributes of God. That's why it's so important to, and it's it's a, actually a rabbi, it's a rabbinic law to get your own rabbi, the one that you're always going to follow and the ones you're always going to be learning from him or from her. Very important. Why? Because according to Maimonides, that's the best way to fulfill the commandment of clinging to God by clinging to a rabbi, by learning from a rabbi how to understand God. And why is so, that so important? Because that's exactly what God told Moses. And we learn it from there. And yes, we have our own concept of good and bad, but now we can enrich that by understanding life in general from a divine point of view through the teachings of the rabbis. Any comments so far? Other than Debbie Pollack, I can see your comment here. You say, it's so important to have positive influences in our lives. That's correct. That's correct. In fact, uh, not just the rabbis, it's very important always to find, for example, mentors. 
in our lives that they are going to help us reach your divine purpose. Uh, in fact, I learned once uh, that we have three ways to learn how to do things properly in life. Three ways. And they were saying, number, and the three words are with the letter M. First one is mistakes. <laughs> right? Mistakes. Why is that? Because if you make a mistake, eventually you'll, you'll learn from the mistake and then the next time you're going to do it properly. Right? But they would say that's the slow way of doing it. Because there is a second M that is mentors. Why is so important? Because the mentors, usually they already made the mistakes. So you're going to learn from their mistakes and you're going to reach your, goal, your goals way faster. Because when you reach a mentor who already had those mistakes, the person will actually help you to avoid those mistakes. And hey, I don't know about you, but I prefer to learn from somebody else's mistake than from my own mistakes, right? So that's why it's very important to have a rabbi or a mentor that is going to guide you in that. And they say the third M is money, in the sense that sometimes money can buy you wisdom. You can buy a good book, you can buy a course, etc. So it will always also help you to develop better understanding by increasing your wisdom, your wisdom. So Debbie, you said favorite mitzvah, let me put it here. You said my favorite mitzvah is learning Torah. Learning Torah is equivalent to all the other mitzvot, Talmud Torah, Kineged, Kulam. Yeah, very interesting because this is basically uh, the learning Torah adds wisdom and wisdom will help you to have a, hopefully a happier life. You're going to know what to do and especially what not to do. So let's go back to Alaha and there is something that I want to I, I wanna teach you here. And uh, it's the fact that yes, to study Alaha and to study about God, it's all good. It's all important. But sometimes it's not enough. And what I learned in my life is that you can fulfill basically the 613 commandments plus all the rabbinic laws that you can imagine and you can still be a bad person. Do you know that? Because when you have uh, law, in this case it's divine law, right? The law from God. Hi Tina, Tina Gilich, welcome to the class. Welcome to the class. Chag Shavuot Sameach. And yeah, I said because basically with for every law that you have, you can find uh, loopholes. <laughs> Tell me about that. Now I, I just saw in the newspaper, for example, that the government of Manitoba is urging their uh, the people not to find loopholes to the Health Act to try to uh, beat the pandemic. Right? We are ask for example to stay at home or to avoid certain things but some people they they feel they are so smart that they can find loopholes and they still meet with people because the thing is not considered by the law or the law is not so clear so i can still do it so you see you can still follow the law the, the letter the letter of the law but you can violate the spirit of the law so to be a, a good person and an ethical person doesn't necessarily mean that you fulfill all the commandments because you can fulfill all the commandments and still be a bad person if you know how to find the loopholes. And yeah, Clyde, oh, uh, let's see, Clyde, uh, Karen, you you have a comment here. I said if having a mentor is better than making your own mistakes, then is read the, then is reading books and taking courses better than having a mentor. No, I think it's the same. It's the same. They are at the same level. It's another way of you get mentored by what you read. Because usually books that really help us are talking and many of the books they are talking about other people's experiences. So we get we we can actually relate to what they went through. So it will help us to avoid their mistakes or to follow their good things. So yeah, that's uh 
That's why I think both are important. To have a physical mentor, it, it, nothing beats that. But you can also read it or study it in a, in a course. Yeah. Uh, so let me tell you this. When we are talking about loopholes, look at this. This is just from, uh, we, we recently read that in the Torah, that it says, when you sell property to your neighbor or buy any from your neighbor, you shall not wrong one another. And then the other verses, do not wrong one another, but fear your God, for I, the Lord, am your God. And if you ask me, the verse 17 seems to be unnecessary because the Torah already said it. When you sell property to your neighbor or buy any from your neighbor, you shall not wrong one another. Go, okay, I got it. I understood. Why do we need the second verse that said, do not wrong one another, but fear your God, for I, the Lord, am your God? Because sometimes you can't, quote, unquote, outsmart the law, and you can still wrong another person. But, but, if you always consider that God is watching and you're a kind of person that like to put God first place in his or her life and you don't really want to disappoint God, then you're not going to be a person who is going to go through life trying to find loopholes in God's law. Because it's not only about not wronging one another because God said so, because it's, it's right there, because God gave you a specific example. And if it's something that you want to do that is not really, that, that, that it's not really exactly or explicitly represented in the Torah, you can do it. No, you can always have to do it because it's a wrong thing to do. Don't do it. It's bad. Well, but there is no specific law. It doesn't matter. You should know better. God is looking at you and you already feel that it's not good. It's already inside you. So sometimes it's not just the letter of the law. There is also a spirit of the law. And we have to also learn from that. Uh, Joan Saif, what do you say? Let me read it here. A teacher might say that because students learn different ways, some people need a course or they need a book or one-on-one -on -one mentor. What is your learning style? Yeah, I, I, I agree. But different people will have different ways. <coughs> yeah, absolutely. Different people, different way. I don't think there is one way. And hey, some people like to learn from their own mistakes. If that's you, I'm good with that. I was just saying that my style, I, I rather prefer to learn from somebody else's mistake and to save, my, save myself uh, the pain or having to, to do that. So, and I have one more text that I want to share with you. And then we can finish this class so I can prepare the, the stream from the next one. As we all know, we are we just finished the counting of the Omer last night. Tonight is, is Shavuot, Revelation of Torah. And remember that uh, the, the counting of the Omer is supposed to be a period when you refine yourself. So Torah makes sense in your life. So I found this text to be beautiful. And it says, upon conclusion of the 49 days, we arrive at the 50th day, Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah. After we have achieved all we can accomplish through our own initiative, traversing and refining every emotional corner of our psyche, we then receive a gift, Matan in Hebrew, from above, that is the Torah. We receive that which we could not achieve with our own limited faculties. We receive the gift of true freedom, the ability to transcend our human limitations and touch the divine. But the interesting thing about this is Torah will never make sense to you if you don't do the other process first. In other words, You should be a good person even before you open the Torah. You should, you should find ways to purify your heart 
to become a better human beings, to be kind, to help others. Once you develop that, once that those values are part of your life, then and only then this divine gift that is Torah is going to take you to the next level. But uh, first we have to do the homework ourselves and to find ways even before we receive the Torah to become, to be, to become better people. So then the Torah will make sense and we can become partners of God in this world. So, uh, yeah, Judge Rocky Pollack, you say we still require a great teacher, Rabbi. Okay, yes. We all need teachers. I have my teachers, you have your teachers. Uh, it's su supposed to be uh, a life. It, this, is a, this is a journey. You want to achieve it like a like, like in a second. It takes time. And that's why we keep celebrating Shavuot year after year. That's why we keep counting the Omer year after year. Because it's an it, it's a lifetime process. But once we engage on it, then it's uh, it's great for our, for our lives, for our soul. And by extension it's good for the world. So thank you everyone. Thank you so much. I'm going to uh, stop the stream now, and at 10 o'clock, it's going to be. Uh, is, we are going to start with the next stage, which is the uh, all-night study with Rabbi Matthew Leibel and myself. And so, hope you see you there. Remember that for the for the next stage, the chat won't be monitored, so feel free to talk among yourselves. But chances are, unless that I am connected here and there, that I won't read what you type there. So again, thank you so much. Chag uh, Sameach, everyone. I hope you enjoy the class and you enjoy Rina's class. Uh, and have some kugel, maybe some pizza, some ice cream, some chocolate to celebrate Shavuot. I hope to see you soon. Good night, everyone. Chag Sameach.